Okay, and without any further delay, I'd like to turn things over to Christina Cleveland, Senior Director, Talent Development Solutions, Canadian Management Center. Thanks so much, Erin, and hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. I'm really excited to welcome you here for this topic on influencing others. It's such an essential skill to develop regardless of where your role sits in, in an organization. Uh, we're often faced with the challenge of needing to influence uh, individuals, influencing our leaders, and even influencing friends and family members. So the skills that you uh, uh, develop today, I have no doubt, are going to be able to support you. Uh, for those of you who are new to Canadian Management Centre, our focus is on preparing the next generation of leaders to thrive in tomorrow's marketplace. We, we are a talent transformation and development company, and we deliver programs across the country and also consult and work with organizations um, in, in a variety of industries and sectors to be able to support their talent development needs. Uh, for those of you who are, have participated in the webinar before, welcome back. Uh, you'll be familiar with this uh, phase of us inviting you to join the conversation on social media. Uh, we do have our Twitter handle up on screen right now, and if you tweet uh, insights from today's session, please use the hashtag CMC events to be part of that conversation. And as Aaron mentioned, you will get access to a recording uh, after today's session, uh, so you will receive an email that will give you um, details of that, and through that you'll be able to see a visual of the slides um, from today's session. Uh, so you won't have to listen to just me today. Uh, you have the great pleasure of uh, um, in being introduced to one of our uh, esteemed facilitators, Valerie Tremblay. Um, Valerie is a experienced facilitator and consultant who focuses in um, and specializes in team building, communication, leadership, change management, as well as conflict management, so all disciplines that require uh, your influencing capability. Uh, Val has experience working inside organizations uh, as a, a generalist and in, in a leadership position managing in an HR function, all the way up through to being at the executive level as a vice president, uh, and she's worked both within Canadian-based as well as multinational organizations. So I'm really excited to welcome her today so she can share um, her own experience and insights, as well as some key concepts that will help you develop your influencing capability. So Val, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Such a large number of participants on the call today. My name is Valérie Tremblay. You might notice a slight accent. It's French-Canadian, so you might hear me put the emphasis on the wrong syllable a few times during today's webinar, and I say that with, with much love to my, um, my, my French-Canadian colleagues. Um, my intention for today is to give you some insights around the topic of influence, and so I'm hoping that by the end of this call, you all have one action or one idea or something that you might want to try to move the needle for you on the topic of influence. Um, on, a pers on a personal level, I'll share with you right now that uh, one, of, one of the reasons, I'm, I'm trying to influence my husband to Airbnb one of the rooms in our house. And as we go through today's content, I'm hoping for myself as well to get some insight to, um, to get him to do just that. But I'd like to share with you a, um, a bit of a, of a story, um, call it a prickly situation, and how I learned about the importance of influence um, earlier on in my career. Um, and I want to give you that as context because I think some of the lessons that we'll be sharing in today's webinar really come to life when we look at them through the lens of what we could have done differently in a situation. So the context is this. I get my first promotion in a big organization. I'm the director. I'm a director for the first time. and. Um, there's a transformational project going on that has many different components. One of the components, and I'm going to give you some details because it helps to understand the context. One of the components is the installation of a software, a performance management software. And as part of my due diligence, I interview vendors, I do lots of research, sell the senior leadership team on a way forward, and everybody buys in, which is great. And I get to the point of implementation, and I'm told by the company that I work with who owns the software, that in order for me to be able to roll out the software globally in our organization, I'm going to need to assign every employee a unique user ID. So I figure that's just a technical thing. It's going to be quite easy to do. And so I ask around, and I, I try to figure out who owns this information and I'm led to the payroll department and the compensation department and I'm asked to speak to Betty who's a, a peer of mine who's also a director about assigning unique user IDs and so I've not worked with Betty very much in the past but I just you know give her a call and I say here's the situation as a department we're going down this uh, this path and Betty I need you to um, help me out here and assign a unique user ID to all of our employees so that I can move forward with the implementation. 
That's really exactly how I phrased it to her, and I thought it made good logical sense. I mean, I gave her some really strong arguments about why we needed to do that, and Betty said, no. And I said, well, what do you mean, no? And all of a sudden, I started, <laughs> I started feeling a little bit anxious about the situation, thinking to myself, if Betty doesn't help me with this, I'm not going to reach my goals. And that was the first moment, I think, where I realized the importance of influence and decided that I really needed to try another tack if I was going to get any movement here and meet my objectives. So I just want to lead in with that. I'll tell you how the situation unfolded a little bit later, but let's, let's get into what we're going to cover in today's webinar. Um, there are, there's, there's research that's done. There's best practices around this. And so I want to share with you some of the building blocks of influencing individuals to get to certain outcomes. I want to give you a bit of a roadmap so that you can get some ideas around how to do that best. Not everyone um, sees things the way we see things. There's a saying that says we see the world as we are, not as it is. That we all come to the, our jobs with unique experiences and filters and sometimes these get in the way of our ability to influence. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's in your way and what you can do about this. Um, seeing the big picture will affect your ability to influence up. And as I teach this topic to people, I often find that managing up is a, is a key component of influencing. Um, people want to share some um, key messages with their bosses, and they're not sure how to do that in order for it not to be a career-limiting move. So we're going to talk about influencing up somewhat. And ultimately, if you can walk away from this webinar with a few strategies to help you involve your key stakeholders and get their commitment, I'm going to consider it a success. So let's go back to basics for a minute and define what influence means. If you were to look it up in the dictionary, just for all of us to get on the same page, we define influence as the capacity or the power of persons or things to be a compelling force or produce effects on the actions, behaviors, opinions of others. So a lot of times we're focused on what we want people to do, but you'll notice in this definition that there's also a component of how do we want people to think and how do we want people to feel? And that's an important question around the idea of influencing. Now, if I go back to my scenario, which I shared with you a few minutes ago, um, I had zero capacity to influence because my stakeholder, who was one of my peers, didn't really want to um, embark on the journey that I needed her to embark on. So I'd love to hear from you now if we could bring up a poll, one of our first polls. I want to put this in context as much as possible. Um, who, are, who is it that you're struggling to influence? Now, these polls are anonymous. We're not going to tie them back to you, but we'd love for you to use um, the little radio buttons here and, and pick um, what comes to mind for you right now. Who are you struggling to influence? And, and what's, the out, what's the effect of that? What barrier is created for you here? Is it, like me, uh, an impediment to you re achieving your results? Um, is it low collaboration? People don't want to get on board with you. Are you not being as efficient and effective as you can because of efforts you're duplicating? Does it slow you down in terms of productivity? Is it just a morale thing? I say just, but it's much more than that. Is it a morale thing? If you can uh, weigh in on this poll, take a minute here and think about your current influence scenarios. So just a reminder that the poll is opened up on the right-hand side of your screen. So go ahead and select the option under question one and question two. And then please make sure you just click on that submit button so that your responses come through to us. And we'll close out the poll um, and get a sense of where we are for those of you participating today. Um, and we realize that in on any given day, it could be all of the above in terms of some of these um, options. So just think about a current scenario, something you're dealing with in the moment, um, and let us know who you're struggling to influence. It could be uh, up in the organization, across, and certainly down. Um, so Aaron, maybe if we can go ahead and close out the poll, um, just to see the, where were the results uh, netted out for us. Um, so it looks like the majority of us participating today um, is selected option D, people I don't have formal authority over. Uh, second to that was my leader or senior leaders, so managing up. And then the barrier that that creates looks like the majority are indicating, Val, that they are not able to achieve results um, or mm -hmm. the, um, the impact of slowed productivity and certainly um, demotivating uh, came up as a barrier. 
Wow. I feel in really great company, Christina, because I'm, I'm totally <laughs> thinking back to my scenario, and that was exactly it for me. I did not have any formal authority over uh, my peer, and I – I think I called her Betty at the beginning of the webinar, and now I'm, I'm, I was trying to protect her name and not call her her real name, so we'll call her Betty Diane. I don't know what I said, but um, I didn't have any formal authority, and at the same time, um, when I, just so to give you a little bit more information, when I went to see my senior leader about it, the fact that Diane wasn't collaborating, um, what I got as a response is you're both directors, figure it out. So I also had a second influence strategy, or influence them, Della and I here and trying to influence my senior leader. And I could absolutely agree with these poll results as well. Um, it makes it hard for us to achieve results and can feel very demotivating and slow us down. So thanks for your responses in the polls. Um, you know, interestingly, we can see from your response why influence matters, right? And we need to achieve results with and through others. I and mean, when you're an individual contributor, you're responsible for your own results. Sometimes you move to a manager, director, a position and you get your results through others. And what I've found in organizations these days is that the flatter we get, the more that calls on our ability to influence without formal authority. So we, we are told, you know, don't work in silo, collaborate with other people. And we don't have that, that hierarchy to force people to do what we want. Um, so that said, I'm also looking at the amount of global organizations um, there's a growing need for collaboration, which means inviting different perspectives. And we do know that diverse teams with diverse perspectives get to better results, especially when we're, we're serving clients that aren't um, that, that are that are very different in their needs as well. And so um, I'll add to that the context in which the economic context in which we're in, um, doing more with less. I'm sure many of you are asked to do this on a daily basis, and that leads to you finding ways to be more efficient. And last but not least, you know, um, there's a sense that the power doesn't often come with title anymore. Title doesn't confer as much power as it used to. And so it's not because we call you a VP or a director. Uh, people might comply with you, but that's not how you build engagement as a leader. You build engagement by creating um, you know, the necessary collaboration with people. So I um, want to share with you now one of the most common misper misperceptions around the, con the concept of influence. So, Christina, if you, yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of us think that influence is about getting what we want or getting people to do what we want them to do. I want you to give me unique user ideas for everyone so that I can implement this great tool for our entire organization. That's what I thought as well. But if you think about it, what influence really is, is about getting people to want to do what you're suggesting or recommending. Let me say that again, because there's a big, big insight for me. Influence is not about getting what you want. Influence is about getting people to want to do what you're suggesting or recommending. And so if you think about where that starts, that really starts with understanding the needs and the interests of the people that you're trying to influence. So I'm sure everybody can use the chat here for a minute. Um, before we go there, Christine, I'm just interested in, in, in hearing people in the chat box. What's the difference to you between influence and manipulation? What's the difference between, how would you define manipulation? If anybody can, has an idea of that. Go ahead and chat it in the chat box. You can find the chat panel again on the right-hand side of your screen. Just select the option to chat. And when you're uh, looking at the send to option, just fill out all panelists so that way both Val and I um, are able to see your responses as they come in. So how would so, we, what's the difference between influencing and manipulation? All right, thank you, Hillary. I love that. Um, okay, so some really good insights if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at the chat. There's this whole notion of manipulation being underhanded or negative or, um, or, or having control or trickery, right? It seems sneaky. We have that comprehension of manipulation being sneaky. So thank you, everybody. Those are, those are really great definitions. Manipulation is really trying to control someone or something um, to your own advantage, and there's, it's often done unfairly or dishonestly. And so manipulation here isn't the goal. Um, influence 
is the goal. And thank you, Cassandra. Intent does make the difference, right? And so if we, if we think about what's at the heart of our challenge, most of the time, people aren't motivated to do what we want them to do. If they don't share a sense of urgency, they're busy with their own priorities, and they may have some underlying reasons for resisting. As I came to find out, uh, you know, with Betty Diane's scenario, giving me my unique user ideas, ideas may put her in a very difficult position from trying to deliver what she needed to deliver on, and I didn't understand that. So. To break down the walls here, one of the things we want to do is create powerful connections with people. And, and, and that's the work that's done at the outset. You know, we say go out and, and meet people and understand what their needs are and build relationships. That becomes fundamental as you try to influence people. Because if you do like me and you just pick up the phone and you say, I need something or I want something, chances are you're not going to get what you are going to um, or what you're striving after. So what you're seeing on the screen now, Dr. Mark Goldston, the friend of CMC, and there's a concept that he introduces in his book, Real Influence, a little picture of it on the slide. It's this concept of disconnected and connected influence. And what he's doing here is differentiating between what people typically do versus what they should be doing. His premise is that disconnected influence is an outdated strategy. It's, it's a short-sighted, more focused on, on being right. And, and, you know, if you look at what's on the left-hand side in the blue here, that might get you momentary buy-in, but it's often at the expense of trust and relationships. And one of the things that Dr. Goldson says is when you're stuck in your here, you can't get to there there. And that's one of the things that you need to be doing in order to move forward. So as you contrast disconnected and connected influence, what are, what are some of the things that are popping up for you? What are some of the insights that you're having? And I'll invite you to use the chat panel again. I know that most of you cannot see what's in the chat panel, so I'm going to summarize what the insights are that are coming from the group here as, um, as I give people just a moment to weigh in. The insights that you're having here, contrast between disconnected and connected influence. Well, well, as the responses are coming in, I'll just share that one, one thing that emerged for me in learning this concept was you know, really trying to get to the crux of why somebody else may be resisting or, or objecting a particular view. And just as you shared with your story about um, Betty, it's like needing to understand what's at stake for them. Yes, and I, as you were saying that, one participant wrote, seeing first to understand, seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. Um, it's, it's, there's this whole notion of collaboration, right? And I, empathy is in there. There's a mutual win-win. It's how we rally together to make things work. Um, and, and, and the disconnected for some people that are actually weighing in here is about telling versus the connected is how do we work together to make that happen? There's this whole notion of short-term versus long-term uh, interaction and building relationships as well. So um, fantastic. These are phenomenal comments and, and, and insights that people are having, um, and I much appreciate uh, you weighing in. Aha, some of you may be familiar with this reference that's up on the screen now. The ethos, pathos, and logos dates back to Aristotle, and he identified these as the ingredients for persuasion or to appeal to others. So real quick, what ethos is, is an appeal to ethics, right? It's an appeal to credibility, authority, experience, alignment of value. Um, there's a lot of organizations that, that use this approach to great success, if you think about it. Uh, pathos, the appeal to emotion relating to someone's experience, desires, interests. Um, and you might know if you watch advertising that that's one of the tricks of the trade. How can we get your emotions to surface? And there's another uh, wonderful author in the area of influencing called Robert Cialdini, who's done, a, Dr. Cialdini, an enormous amount of research on the science of persuasion. And um, what he suggests, actually his research first began when he was trying to figure out 
how to not be deceitful and manipulative in terms of creating emotion in people. So how to influence um, in a way that is genuine, sincere, and non-manipulative. And um, and a lot of what he found in his research is that advertising or companies, um, you know, leverage pathos quite well. Logos is the appeal to rational thinking. So sometimes um, some of us are, are influenced when people present facts or evidence or proof. And uh, and, and so as I think about, well, as I look at this triangle, I think about think, do, feel. A lot of times when we're trying to influence, we are focused on the element of what we want people to do. Right, what do I need you to do for me? I need you to give me unique user ID. If you don't do that, I won't be able to implement my system. My system. And I mention that because Many a times we don't really spend any time thinking about how we want people to feel and what we want people to think. And how is what we are presenting aligned with their values? How are we building trust from the outset? So um, <laughs> in a lot of cases we need a combination of these elements to uh, move the needle on people and get them to actually uh, come to our side of the fence and collaborate with us and share our perspective. And when you're in a position to influence up, it's even more critical to gain the insights into what type of information is going to connect with whoever you're trying to influence with, uh, whoever you're trying to influence. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've had to present to senior leadership teams and organizations where I'm told I've got an hour of content and I'm told bottom line on top, what are the three key takeaways and how are you going to support that evidence with facts? I know that if I don't go there first and foremost with that target audience, my chance of influencing is going to be limited. So I go back to this whole notion of what do you know about them? What do you know about your stakeholders? What do you know about the type of information that they need? Um, and although you might want them to do something, what do you want them to think and what do you want them to feel? Food for thought for you right there. Um, Christina, I would love to hear from our audience once again. What is your main challenge in influencing others? Is it people stuck in their own position? Is it perhaps miscommunication or misunderstanding? Is it a question of turf wars or silos? Are you realizing perhaps that you lack familiarity with who your audience is? Uh, or is it maybe resistance, resistance to something new? Maybe, like Christina said earlier, maybe it's a bit of everything. Um, you know, talked about who you're trying to influence and what happens when you can't, trying to influence your peers and your senior leadership, but what happens What's getting in the way of your ability to influence? Let me give you a minute here to um, to answer this poll. So again, just a reminder, it's opening up on the right-hand side of your screens. And once you selected your um, uh, option for uh, what your main challenge is, just don't forget to click on the Submit button so that we can get those responses in. Um, and I know earlier, uh, Val, you made a mention that as organizations get flatter, um, our influencing skills are, are being called uh, uh, upon. And someone mentioned in the chat panel that um, key skill of empathy, which certainly ties in uh, to influence. So I think yeah. you know, as much as we look at what our challenges in influencing other people, if we're feeling frustrated, chances are on the other end that individual could be frustrated too. That's a great point, Christina, great point. And I'm sure that many of you are looking at this list going, could we pick all of them <laughs> because we're challenged by all of these things? Um, and I'm asking you to, what's the main one if you were to try to sum it up, what would you say? So Erin, let's go ahead and close out the poll so that we can see the results that are coming in. Uh, oh, interesting. Some diversity. So. 29% indicating that you've got other individuals who may be stuck in their own position. Um, another 29% of you indicating resistance to something new. So certainly influence comes into play in the change management space and Val has a lot of experience there. Uh, and then uh, third in, in place is turf wars and silos. So it looks like we had uh, impact across the board, but those are the top three. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good insight. Um, and I find just a little bit of research for you before we get into some solutions. 
when people resist something new, resist change, we find through our research that lack of awareness as to why the change is needed is the number one reason for resistance. So I always find that fascinating. Um, we have something called, you know, uh, it, it is a bias, it's an unconscious bias, but it's called a transparency bias. We think that people know what we're thinking, <laughs> but oftentimes they don't, and we don't spend a lot of time talking about the, the, we talk about what's changing. I mean, I assigned a really cool name to my project or the implementation of my system, but you know, did I spend a lot of time explaining why that change was needed and why it was needed now? So that came to mind as I thought about resistance to something new, and I see a lot of you, so you are stuck with people who just don't want to move because that's where, the, well, that's where they're at, and there's probably really valid reasons for that. So without further ado, I would love to share with you some of the key concepts from many of our programs at CMC, we've distilled them into five building blocks for you. And, and these five components outline the critical phases or activities that you need to engage in order to be most effective in getting buy-in and inspiring other people to action to make them want what you want. And so I'll walk through all five and please look at them through the lens of, is there something new perhaps that I have not tried here in my specific influence scenario that I might be able to apply after this webinar? Um, I know it's an hour of your time and we're not together for long, but as I mentioned at the beginning, if there's one insight that you have where you can walk away from today's call and say, I'm going to go try this out, then I think it will be, have been a good return on investment for you. So let's move to the, the first building block. Credibility. Ha. This is about walking the talk, right? Um, people believe you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Here's the rub. You earn credibility over time. And the criteria for earning it varies from person to person. So think about how you would gauge, I can't always have trouble saying that word, gauge, gauge, credibility in someone else. What makes you find someone credible? So curious to hear you on that and just, you know, what, how do you gauge credibility in someone else? Give me some, some insight here in the chat box as I continue. But if you think about it, the people that are credible, their actions, you know, in French is an expression we say, les bottines suivent les babines. <laughs> the boots follow the lips. Um, but people who will earn credibility are typically very accountable for their behavior and their actions. And we're very confident in people who have built strong credibility with us, whether it's through their emotional quotient, they're genuine, they're sincere, or whether it's through the um, facts that they've been able to give us, um, whether it's the way they lead by example. Um, and, uh, and a lot of what I'm seeing you comment on is that there's, you know, when people follow through, that really gain, gives them credibility. And when they can't follow through and they give you a heads up so that you can find a plan B or work with you to find, find a plan B because life happens, um, that also buys cred credibility. So. We're usually very confident, if you think about it, about people who built strong credibility with us. We, we take what they say at face value. And what diminishes credibility is not following through, obviously. Um, some of the things I'm seeing in the chat is people that are focused on their self-interest with, and withhold information that don't, that don't really explain to you why they need why they need and what, what's in it for you, actually. Uh, people who aren't transparent about their intentions, if, if, if there's not that relationship built there, that might lead us to wonder if they have ulterior motives or trying to be manipulative. Um, people who aren't accountable. And last but not least, to go back to that concept of seek to understand before seeking to be understood, um, people who are close to input are oftentimes people who, um, you know, the, the, the people who pretend to know it all, that impedes our ability to find them credible. So bottom line, if I think back to my scenario, I definitely had not spent a lot of time trying to build credibility with Betty Diane. I think the, the second time I called, I, when, the, when I called her, it was the second phone call I had made to her. Um, so that was really an impediment for me. But when you have credibility, it creates safety with others because they're more open to share information and insights. And it takes a while to build that. Um, I started my career as a junior consultant, and I remember oftentimes 
paying close attention to what the senior partners were saying that they wanted or needed. And when I could make a link between information that I had, I often um, gave it freely. I would send an email and say, hey, I read an article about this and you mentioned it yesterday when you were giving us that lunch and learn, I thought you might be interested. Or I heard something about a client here that might be of interest to you and sharing that information openly, openly over time helps you build communication, uh, influence, sorry. Let's move on to our second building block. Curiosity. What does that mean? Huh, well, do I have a genuine interest in other people's perceptions and perspectives? How am I able to see things from their point of view? What kind of questions am I asking to gain insights and gather information? So again, I go back to this concept of seeking to understand before seeking to be understood. If you can start from a position of being curious, you might have a more objective view and a willingness to understand and listen. Had I picked up the phone that day and said to Betty Diane, hey, curious to know what are some of the challenges that you're facing right now in your world? It might have, you know, what are, what are the factors that are impeding your ability to deliver results? And which one of these are important to you and why? And I started out just by asking some open-ended questions and start and trying to view the world from her lenses, it might have been easier for me to position my ask down the line. So again, there, there needs to be intent here, absolutely intent. You've got to intend to be curious um, and not do it in a manipulative way. Uh, sometimes, you know, if I think about it, there's invisible barriers at play that really require us to deepen our understanding so that we can move forward. Had I done that, I would have understood that Betty Diane with a unique user ID would not be able to hold, um, she was responsible for compensation, we were doing a lot of things on spreadsheets, and the way she mapped all of the information together in her world uh, made it really difficult um, for her to be able to give me what I wanted. So obviously, um, sometimes if, if you're influencing up, I want to go back to all the people saying I need to influence up here. That curiosity of yours will be targeted to uncovering the priorities of the people that you're trying to influence because if you can connect what you're doing to their strategic agenda, that might give you the influence that you need. Um, so what could diminish influence? Well not inviting input from other people, telling, not asking, um, not being open to new ideas, lacking awareness of the context in which they're operating. So this whole notion of curiosity allows you to discover more about the other person and really has a, a byproduct or benefit, if you would. It increases relatedness. You're building relationships. Our brains categorize everyone. It is a universal tendency to categorize. How we do it as individual, but I mean, every time you meet someone, you're creating in-group or out-group in your main, in your brain. So getting curious about other people builds relatedness. Building relatedness creates in-group, that's a bunch of neuroscience there, and in-group gets you closer to be able to influence. So it's about caring to learn about people. Thank you, Kathy, uh, and their challenges and, and how you can move with them. Thank you so much. Moving on to uh, building block number three. And Christina did say that there was going to be a Q&A at the end of the call. Um, if you do have questions, I'm going to invite you to hold them for a little bit because I want to make sure that I'm, I'm capturing them. So, um, so that we're capturing them so that we can answer them. All right, connection. How are we deliberately building relationships? And here's the... Oh, the tough one here is, is when I think about that and when I say that, a lot of people tell me I'd love to do that, but I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time. There's too much to do. However, it's a catch-22 because when you do spend some time doing that, you're going to be in a better position to understand your audience, build rapport, and engage in a more reciprocal exchange. So if you go back to the research I shared a few minutes ago, Connected influence is really about viewing others as collaborators and eliciting that same response from them. When you're creating that spirit of exchange and of sharing and you're focused on ensuring mutually beneficial outcomes, um, <laughs> that helps, right? So how do you do that? How can you create connection? Well, I mean, the obvious one is taking the time to know them, 
um, maybe sharing something of value or asking yourself, what could I learn from this person? Uh, here's what not to do. I'm stuck in my scenario with Betty Diane, and she works out of somewhere in the U.S., and I decide that my project is so important to me that I'm going to fly out there and take her for lunch. I was a little bit manipulative, if I think back, because I had a hidden agenda. I wanted her to treat her to lunch, and I wanted to build connection. A little bit too late, I'm going to say now. Hindsight is 2020. Um, and so we went for lunch, and I tried to do everything right. I was building connection. And, um, and at the end of the lunch, I said to Betty Diane, could you, um, so how about that unique user ID? Are, are we aligned? Are you going to make sure that that happens? And she said, no. <laughs> I mention this to you because um, when we are deliberate about building relationships, we need to think about it oftentimes outside the moment of what we want or need something, right? So it can be as simple as how do I behave in my interactions with other people in meetings? Am I showing interest? Am I building connectedness? Am I, um, you know, what's my intention? Um, and so that you don't end up in a situation where you only talk to someone or, or start caring about what they think the first time you need something from them. So connection is absolutely critical to solidifying relationships. And those are built on trust and credibility, and, and, and there's more likely going to be open discussion and buy-in and commitment. Um, because connection absolutely does reduce resistance. If I can see the world from your point of view, I'm bridging that gap much more success successfully. The next one's a big one, and we have lots and lots of, um, of amazing uh, content and trainings on this at CMC. Um, it seems really obvious, you're going to say communication, yep, <laughs> but it's one that can really easily trip us up. It's not just about what we're trying to communicate, but it's the approach that we take and the mode that we take. So if you think about what communication is, it's a two-way dialogue, right? Um, let me restate what I heard from you and what I'm going to do as a result of this. Let me demonstrate that I've understood your interests and your perspective. So think about what diminishes um, this, this wonderful concept of communication. I can think of a couple of things. First of all, not understanding the communication style of the person that you are speaking to. Are they someone that wants you to be brief, be bright, be gone, bottom line on top, start with the facts, you know, very, very driven? Or are they someone that um, needs you to spend a bit of time to build rapport? Are they someone that is more introverted, meaning they need time to think and process before they speak? Or are they more extroverted? Do they think and talk at the same time? The challenge here is if you've got an extrovert in front of you, it's really easy to understand what they're thinking because they're normally talking and thinking at the same time. But if you've got someone with an introversion preference, they might need um, a little bit of probing and you to ask some questions to figure it out. Language barriers are often big barriers here. You know, sometimes we work in, in global organizations where we don't have English as a first language, um, all of us. And so are, are we using TLAs? <laughs> I love that. Do you all know what TLAs are? Are we using three-letter acronyms to communicate and, and losing people in the process? Um, so <laughs> and, and <laughs> you got to tailor your communication um, to suit the needs of your audience. And when you are communicating, there's another, another thought for you. If you don't acknowledge concerns or if you select the wrong mode to communicate your message, how many of you have ever tried to explain something really emotional on email? Maybe that's not the right mode or the right medium. So you need to adapt your approach here. And uh, again, I will say this, in, a, in, in the array of, of offerings we have at CMC, there's so many um, courses that really help hone our focus around this very broad topic of communication. It's key for influencing, for sure. So here's my last one. Yeah, I, somebody just chatted about, thanks, Hillary. Body language speaks volume. We communicate with our words. There is, um, you know, lots of research that's done by Mr. Morabian, Dr. Morabian around communication. It's not, the words are the smallest part of it, especially in an area of conflict. We communicate with our body language and with our tone and with our pace significantly. And if you think about email as an asynchronous form of communication, I will not go down that rabbit hole. I know I could, but there's so much to say about that. All right. 
Finally, my last building block is commitment. So I define commitment as a desired outcome of influence, right? So it's about what you're going to do, and it's also about what the other person is going to do. So big picture, this is really about increasing willingness and getting engagement and increasing support and achieving buy-in and following through. So when you've understood the person's perspective and when you've shared yours, you're really open to working together to create a unified vision, and, and that helps people see how you can work together towards the same goal. Um, here's, where, here's where the trap you might not want to fall into. You stop once you get what you want. So let's say that, you know, I get, I get Betty Diane to give me that unique user ID and I never um, collaborate with her again. I might get her to comply once. I'm diminishing the long-term <laughs> ability to influence. Um, pushing people to commit before they're ready. That's another big one. I know that we all work in, a, in, in organizations with a high sense of urgency. Um, allowing people to pause and reflect and come to their own insights about why they need what you need is a very powerful way to get long-term buy-in or commitment. And so, um, you know, even though it might lose you a couple of hours, sometimes saying to the person, look, I want to give you some time to think about this tonight and, and make sure that you have all the information that you need. Can I come back to you tomorrow um, and see you know, what else you might be needing to be making an informed decision? might be best than trying to push the envelope. And sometimes you might find when you're influencing that you're not going to get to your ask all the way, right? You might not get to the overall ask immediately. And so are you moving the needle forward in a positive direction? Um, what's one step forward you can get the person to make? One more thing uh, around commitment. Are you only serving your interests? or are you making sure that the interests of the person that you are trying to influence are also served? And so overall, that commitment factor is not just about getting buy-in, but it's also about following through on what you said you were going to do, and that feeds back into credibility. You can see all these linked together. Is that your commitment? Am I going to follow through? Um, ultimately, your actions either build or they erode your reputation, depending on how you show up through the process. And, and how you lead people to commitment. So five building blocks, and I mean, these are really, the, the, if you think about building a house, this is the foundation, the foundation piece around how you build um, your influence. And I'd love to take a moment and hear from you as I was talking you through these. Um, curious to see which of the building blocks you've identified as an opportunity for you to enhance. Either generally speaking, there's one that you might want to invest some time and energy, or maybe you had an influence scenario at the beginning of our call, top of mind, and you think, ha, huh, there's something I can do here to get this person, you know, to move closer to the ideal outcome for both me and the person that I'm trying to influence. We're going to uh, go ahead and open up that poll. And Val, while um, those responses are coming in, I just want to remind people, if you have a question for Val, go ahead and submit it into the Q&A panel, and we'll be transitioning into that segment shortly. Um, but Val, there was a, a comment that came in from Jordan asking, you know, what about collaboration? Where does collaboration fit into those five building blocks? Do you mind just touching mm -hmm. on that while um, we get in the results for the poll? Yeah, absolutely. And Jordan, I would say, I think it depends, it depends how you define collaboration. Um, and to me, collaboration is present within, I mean, all of these, right? There, there's an element of collaboration in each of the, of the building blocks to me. So it, is, it, is it always, it, it's not always about me and what I want. Um, it's also about what, I, what you need from the situation and how are we collaborating to, to accomplish that. So. Um, if, if that didn't answer your question specifically, please go ahead and, and, and put one back um, back in there. But that's what I was thinking as you said that. Two-way street. So the poll, go back to the poll. Yeah, Erin, can we go ahead and close out that particular poll um, so that we can wrap up the results? There. So it looks like the majority of uh, those of you listening today had 30% uh, wanting to focus on um, enhancing your ability to connect with the other individual or individuals, 
uh, and 29% looking at communication. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, a couple of stories here for you all on, on those two big ones. Um, I would say on the communication front, and that's one where I have lots of familiarity. Christina, I'm thinking about some of our offerings. I think we've got um, getting results without, uh, when, yeah, communicating up, down, and across the organization is one of our courses, I think, that really um, that really goes deep into that. Can you think of a few more that, um, that really talk about the communication component? Yeah, well, I think getting results without authority um, is one that you started to mention there as well, and it seems based on the participation from the group today that we're all finding ourselves in a situation that we're trying to influence people who we don't have formal authority over, and I can see yeah. how that um, ability to communicate and then connect in with those individuals, if you're not engaging with them every day, um, is definitely something that you need to put a focused effort on. Yeah, thank you very much. And and, and oftentimes because we, we leave, uh, if you can go back to the previous slide for a minute, oftentimes because we, um, we lead such fast-paced lives, we don't think to connect until we need something from someone. I'd invite you to consider the small moments, whether you're riding up the elevator for, with someone or walking out to the parking lot or, or passing someone, you know, at the end of a meeting. What are, what are some small opportunities that you have with connect, to connect with others? Um, a quick story, um, I started out my career in consulting, and I will never forget a senior consultant saying to me, um, you know, Valerie, when I, when I start working with a new client, um, if I don't know um, whether or not they have kids and where they went to school and whether or not they have a spouse and the name of their spouse, after the third meeting, actually second meeting, he said, I'm not doing my job. So this person really, and, and, it, and again, it's not, it's not meant to be an interrogation. I'm not saying sit down with your with your and, and ask these five questions, but it's really about getting curious whenever you have a chance about the people that you work with, um, so that you're, you're you're kind of you know gathering a bank of insight about what it is that, that makes them tick, so that um, when you're in situations where you have to collaborate and work with them, you can definitely um, you, you you know more about them, you care. So so there's ways to connect. Okay, I can move us along now, Christina. I see that the time is shifting. I think we're right on on schedule. Yeah, well, someone, but, someone uh, is asking, um, though, Val, about how you solve the issue on the user login. They want to know the end of that story. Ah, <laughs> they want to know the – yeah, absolutely. So, you know, how they say hindsight is twenty twenty. I learned in that moment that I needed to change my influence strategy and that I needed to do better next time. And I also will tell you quite honestly that I had burned my bridges with Betty Diane. Um, I, it cost me a lot of time. It cost me a lot of effort. It cost me a lot of energy because I did things the wrong way, but sometimes that's where you learn best, right? So my project was delayed, and how I ultimately managed to um, solve my situation is um, I read up about influencing. I, I, I tried to see what I could have done differently. I had a conversation with a coach, and when I saw that, you know, I had really burned my bridges with her, I started um, asking around me, my colleagues, the other directors in the organization, following these principles with them, to figure out, you know, how my solution or my, my unique user ID and what I was implementing might help them with their work. And I did my homework there, and at one point, there was enough people at my lab, like in our, in our peer group, that were bought in to the solution that um, Diane had to make a shift. So interestingly, because I had burnt my bridges, I had to find a workaround, and the workaround came from um, really um, gathering or influencing more more intelligently and more collaboratively my peers around me to get her to move. Um, all that to say, though, I, I could have done it a lot better and a lot more effectively had I known then what I know now. Um, and if this topic interests you, I will say, uh, for me at least, you know, they call me the influencer now at work, so I think I've mastered some of these skills pretty well, and it served me beautifully in my career. Um, again, as long as it's not in the in the manipulation sphere, it um, it can be helpful. So that's the end of the story right there. I'd, I'd love. And this ends the recorded part of our presentation today. My name is Tanya Shravoni, and I'm here to facilitate the live Q and A. So if you've not already taken the opportunity to enter a question in the Q and A panel or the chat panel, I invite you to do that now. I do see there is a question from Nicole, and Nicole asks, 
How do you deal with power struggles while trying to use these building blocks? Uh, that's a great question, Nicole. I think that, so if I understand your question, I'm, I'm assuming it means a power struggle between yourself and one other person. I think going back to what Val said, there are a couple of pieces there. It, it, you know, it depends on your starting place. When you think of those building blocks, you know, what is your credibility with this person? What is your connection with this person? So if you haven't already made that connection or that relationship, you may not know the crux of what's behind the power play. So I think one of the most important building blocks to bring to that conversation would be the one around curiosity. So what is it that this person needs to feel powerful? Uh, maybe what is it about your request and what you're asking them to do that threatens that power? And what is it that ultimately you want that person to feel? So getting back to what is your intention? Are you also on the defensive because you're trying to get your agenda pushed? Are you really coming from a place of collaboration? Um, are you communicating in a way that has this person feel uh, recognized and in control? Because oftentimes what's behind that kind of power play is some sort of fear. So like in the story that uh, Val shared, that individual had a lot at stake by acquiescing to Val's request. And that would make her probably feel less confident, less powerful. So I think really of all the C's that were presented there, the building blocks, curiosity is probably going to be one of the most important um, and really coming up from a place of uh, intention to find a middle ground, a win-win situation. Uh, there is another question coming in from Lillian and she asks, how do you overcome a peer who wants to sabotage your efforts. Ooh, wow, that gets a little ugly. Um, thank you for that question. Well, I think uh, this is somewhat similar, and we might be getting into passive aggressive territory. So um, I don't know, Lillian, in your situation, but uh, sometimes you encounter peers who will say to your face that they're on board, you know, or in front of a group, yes, and then they either try to sabotage, they do something counter to what they said they would do, or they just don't do anything, uh, period. And this is where you may need to engage in some crucial conversations, and um, you'll be happy to know we also have courses in that area. Um, and I would approach this individual and, you know, again, coming from a high intention uh, for resolution, asking, you know, what's, what's in the way? You know, I've, I've asked whatever the situation is, whatever it is you're asked. Um, and asking the person maybe what's getting in the way, asking non-judgmental questions, in other words, because if you, you don't want to ask a question that's going to put them on the defense, but keeping it neutral, uh, you know, what would you need to take a step forward in this initiative? Uh, if you can get the person to make uh, a commitment uh, verbally in front of others, that's also very helpful because that creates what we like to call a social contract. There's a little bit more um, skin in the game for them to follow through. But I think it really is about getting to the crux. So how can you be curious? What questions that can you ask without putting the person on the spot? So it's not like, what's wrong with you? Uh, why are you sabotaging this? I can't believe you would do this. It's more like, you know, what's in the way? What am I not understanding? What would you need to get on board with this? So hopefully um, that is helpful. And thank you, Noreen, for acknowledging that this is a great uh, lesson. Uh, one of the other questions that is very popular as well is how do you influence when you're remote? So this is a question that's near and dear to my heart because I work remotely for CMC. And one thing to note that in our brains from a neuroscience perspective, we have something called a proximity network. So when people are closer to us, we feel safer. Val talked about the in-group and the out-group. So when people are closer, they feel safer. So this puts the emphasis on us to have to get back to that C about connection. How can you be building connections with people that are remote that overcomes our natural bias in our brain to not feel as safe with those people that are um, far away? So again, this is about creating initiatives. So when I go into the office, uh, for example, it can be very easy for me to spend all my time on work and very difficult sometimes to carve out time to build relationships with people that I don't see. So if you have some of those people that are remote and you have an opportunity to spend some time with them, do that. Anything that increases or decreases that distance, can you use Skype for business and do a visual versus a phone connection versus an email? So it gets back to that human connection piece is really gonna enhance that ability. 
Um, and I see that there is another question from Renee. What advice can be given to low-level employees trying to influence senior management when lengthy discussions are undesirable from the senior manager? Okay, so uh, I, I kind of sense two questions embedded in one question there, Renee. So there's this question of style that Val talked about. So one of the things we, we do in our course is really help people understand someone's style. So it sounds like the senior manager just wants you to get to the facts, get to the, the point. Uh, so you want to be able to influence with logic. So I think regardless of your level as an employee, it still comes down to understanding what's important to the senior manager. So if you have um, concerns, regardless of what level you are in the organization, how can you link that concern to something the senior manager wants to achieve? So let's say, for example, you're in a team where there's low engagement, uh, people are just really unhappy. Um, instead of you know, going to the senior manager and saying, you, know, you need to know that people are unhappy, how does that happiness or engagement link to the strategic objectives of that senior manager? Is it about productivity? Is it about sales? How can you tie it to something factual that they're gonna care about? So that requires you to understand the business it requires, you to, it requires you to understand the goals for your unit and that senior manager. It requires you to understand a little bit about the personality of that senior manager. So again, get really curious, and when you can find some of that information, try to deliver it in, in a way that meets that person's um, style as succinctly as possible. We are coming up to the end of the hour, so uh, what I'm going to do is just advance forward. I thank you for your participation. Uh, I do want to summarize for you some of the takeaways in terms of boosting your influence that Val talked about. At the end of the day, this is all built on the foundation of credibility. So if you want to be credible with those senior managers, someone that's a peer, it doesn't really matter who. It really starts with living up to those commitments, being that person that follows through, that walks the talk. So right out of the gate, you'll have a different listening with your audience. You want to come from a place of partnership, and building that partnership can involve sharing information, being very clear with your intention, that you're in this for a mutual win-win. Um, making sure that you're reaching out to people, which can be challenging for some of us. If you're like me, uh, I'm, I'm very introverted. I like people, but I'm not always the first one to initiate those connections. We need to do that in order to build those relationships. It doesn't mean you have to be chatty Cathy, but be intentional in um, building connection with others. And then again, remembering to communicate versus convincing. I wanna let you know that this, these kinds of skills don't get built overnight. So we do have some courses to help you. I wanted to just highlight when they're coming up. We have three day, two day, and one day offerings, depending on your schedule. Getting Results Without Authority, as you can see how that would link to this topic, one of our best-selling courses, as well as Communicating Up, Down, and Across the Organization, and Influencing Skills Workshop. Take a note of these uh, dates, and also they can be found on our website, cmcoutperform.com, where you'll find a bunch of other free resources on this topic, as well as other topics. For those of you who are looking for PDUs for your PMI accreditation to maintain it or earn it, please jot down our rep number here. We are an accredited uh, provider of education with the PMI uh, Project Management Institute. And finally, but still very importantly, you're gonna get the opportunity to fill out a short survey at the end. We wanna hear from you. How did we do? And importantly, what other topics would you be interested in? If this added value to your life, if you're taking away something that you're gonna be able to apply, we wanna do that again in our next webcast. So please take a moment to do that. Thank you in advance for filling out that questionnaire and as well as for your time and participation. Uh, I wish you a great rest of your afternoon and we look forward to you joining us in our next webcast. Thank you.